The Apostle John's New Testament Revelation Unfolded Section 10 Chapter 10 Verse 1 And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed as it were with a cloud in the day of rain, and he appeared as if he were covered that all upon the earth could not see his face, and a rainbow shone from the crown which was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire, and from his countenance came forth a great light upon the earth. The seventh trumpet to sound, or the seventh woe, is an even greater threat to humankind than any of the preceding warnings. This warning gives no portent of demise to a person's physical being, because once a person is dead, the pain, tribulation, and torment of life is over. This final woe becomes the most dreaded of all, because of the figurative, never-ending torment that will be experienced. It is the time when all people must face the truth of reality and judge themselves. This will be done according to what they have allowed themselves to believe and understand in connection with the way they have lived their lives and how they have done unto others. During this time, the voice of the seventh angel the mystery of God that has been known by all prophets and understood by the elect will be revealed in its fullness. The Christ, who is the Messiah, the one appointed to teach us how to live at peace with each other upon the planets of this solar system, is the one who will be the voice of the seventh angel. He is the one about whom the seventh trumpet would have warned the world of his coming had it been sounded. However, John makes no indication that this final seventh angel's trumpet has sounded, as he did specifically with the previous six angels. This final woe will come without warning, when the world is least expecting it. Thus spoke Jesus in parable to his disciples, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 24 verses 42 to 44 John continues his disruption of the earth's cleansing by referencing the allegorical story of the great flood, which ends with a rainbow symbolizing the covenant between God and man that the earth will never be physically destroyed again. John shows this mighty angel, John only refers to this angel as mighty, coming down from heaven, which the inhabitants of the earth do not recognize. Even though it has rained upon the earth, revelation and understanding given to the world by true prophets, the clouds of darkness have shaded it from the light of the sun, and the people do not know, nor do they understand, Christ as he truly is. Thus, John presents him as being clothed as it were with a cloud in the day of rain, and he appeared as if he were covered that all those upon the earth could not see his face. John borrows this metaphor from Ezekiel. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. Ezekiel 1 verse 28 When the Christ appears in glory, his power will be over all the kingdoms of the earth, represented by the crown upon his head made of the same gems as the breastplate of judgment, in which are woven the twelve gems, representing the different tribes of Israel, as explained fully in the commentary on Revelation 4 verse 3. John figuratively expresses that when Christ's face comes from behind the cloud and is revealed to the world, it is as it were the sun because of the light and truth which he shall give to the people of the earth, or the light shining through the twelve gems that creates a rainbow illumination. Wherever his feet take him upon the earth, he will bring a light to a world lying in darkness, and which will cause the people to burn, fire, from within, feet as pillars of fire. Throughout the Old Testament, the prophets used a pillar of fire to describe the Lord leading the people through the night. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness, 
The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day, to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night, to show them light, and the way wherein they should go. Nehemiah 9 verse 19 Verse 2 And he had in his hand a little book open which contained that which was sealed from the foundation of the earth, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, even that his whole countenance did fill the earth, even that there was not a part thereof that was not filled with his light. John presents figuratively that in Christ's return to the earth, mighty angel come down from heaven, he will assure that the instructions of what is to be done next with the earth and its people, as contained in the book of life, are being followed and completed as written therein. The expression that he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth tells us that the whole earth will have knowledge of his arrival, and all will know that the world has been placed in his power. He will universally and recognizably establish his stance, feet, as a pillar of fire. Modern communication technology makes it very easy to understand how one extraterrestrial being might arrive on this planet in one particular location, and at the same time, enable the whole world to tune into what he says and does. Verse 3 And he opened the seventh seal and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roareth and mocketh all afraid, and when he had cried, it was as if seven thunders uttered their voices. Here John presents, figuratively, the ushering in of the millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. Once Christ has established his presence, he will spread the truth to the whole earth and tell the people what needs to be done to establish the proper society so that all can experience peace, happiness, and joy. What he will reveal to the people will be given with power and authority, causing all to submit to his rule. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, In the Lord have our righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Isaiah 45 verses 23 to 24 the seven thunders represent the loud voice of Christ resonating like a lion's roar throughout the seven continents of the world. Every inhabitant on planet Earth will hear what he has to say. Verse 4 And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write that which they spoke, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. For these things shall not come forth unto the children of men until the end of times. All true prophets of God know what is going to occur during the millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. They know the time frame, the procedure, and all the processes and changes that must take place in order to change a world of chaos and inequality characterized by humans who do not do unto others as they would have others do unto them into one of peace and order. John is relating that he was shown what was going to occur, those things which the seven thunders uttered, but was not allowed to explain to the people in his day, in plainness. One of the main reasons why he was not allowed to write what specifically takes place during the millennium is because mortals were not to be given this information at that time. Denying them the truth of these things would allow them the opportunity to experience the full effects of not living the way they should, so that when they are shown the proper way to live by Christ, they will awaken and realize the truth and effectiveness of his teachings and instructions. All prophets are likewise commanded to withhold the knowledge they receive of the mysteries of God until the time appointed to reveal them to the people. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt.
And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, and made white, and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12 verses 1 to 4, 8 to 9. Verse 5. And the mighty angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. Verse 6. And swear by him that liveth for ever and ever, who created heaven, and the things that therein are, and the earth, and the things that therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer, for the time, times, and half of time have passed. And thus I heard the voice of the seventh thunder speak. In this explanation, John sees Christ in the attitude of swearing an oath to the Father that his work will now be done on earth as it is in heaven. His symbolism is borrowed from Daniel, then I Daniel looked, and, behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth for ever that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Daniel 12 verses 5 to 7, the Father's work is to fulfill the covenant that he has made with all of us who were created by him, who were guaranteed that we will all eventually experience joy and happiness forever as we exercise our free agency according to our individual desires. God does not create beings just to leave them in circumstances that would force them to experience suffering and torment without an end, as humans now do upon this earth only a sadistic creator would do this. We were created to experience the ultimate balance of nature happiness. Since this happiness comes from our relationships with each other, and also our ability to interact with our surrounding environs, the covenant Christ is swearing to uphold, lifted up his hand, is that he will create the proper environment, both socially and physically, so that in the end, we can fulfill the measure of our creation and live in peace and happiness eternally. The earth has gone on long enough experiencing the effects of the locusts and the horsemen and their horses. These times of turmoil have been presented figuratively in their proper timetable as understood by the prophet Daniel and thereafter borrowed by John as the time, times, and a dividing of time. A thorough explanation of time, times, and half of time will be given in the commentary of chapter 11. And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. Daniel 7 verses 25 to 28 Christ will end these times of turmoil by revealing the truth to the inhabitants of the world according to the established timetable, unless that timetable is shortened in righteousness because the inhabitants of earth have become righteous on their own accord. The truths he will teach will finally set humankind free from all the falsehoods and deceptions that have continually beset them. 
they will also be relieved from the stings and torments delivered by unrighteous leaders who know nothing of the reality of God's covenant of everlasting peace and happiness which is the mystery of God. Verse 7 But in the days of the voice of the seventh trumpet, when it shall begin to sound, then shall the mystery of God be revealed, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. During the days of Christ, the people of the earth will finally receive the truth concerning the heavens, the earth, and all there is to know about who they are, why they are, and how they came to exist. Unfortunately for the world, and its mighty leaders with their great advancements in science and technology, their pretended knowledge, their religions, their spiritual divinations and imaginations, all these locusts will be revealed for what? They truly are foolish and selfish mortals who imagine these things up in their hearts to satisfy the lusts of their flesh. There are no mysteries to those who know truth and reality. Mysteries, theories, speculations, vain imaginations, perceptions, opinions, and beliefs are invented by those who do not know how, why, and when life came into existence. Science's never-ending determination to try to understand and explain reality leads its followers in a constant race that will continue until one who actually knows what reality is appears to teach those who seek truth. Religion is worse than science in its speculative efforts to satisfy the human ego. Religion has created the impetus for people to search how, why, and who they are without having the proper tools to help the people discover the truth for themselves. Religious leaders have convinced their followers that they, the locusts, are chosen by God to teach people truth and lead them on the right path. Yet, Neither the religions of the world nor any of their leaders have been able to fulfill the covenant of the Father in providing the earth's inhabitants with the happiness and peace he has promised them. Religion and science destroy peace and happiness because of the action and precepts of their locusts and horsemen who torment the people. There is no precept of religion or science that comprehends or properly explains reality which is things as they were, as they are, and as they are to come. Science is a type of religion, just as religion is a type of science, wherein the mystery of life remains a mystery to those who don't understand it, but pretend to. The aim of both science and religion is one and the same in trying to come to a logical conclusion about why, how, and when humans came into existence. The only ones who have known true reality and can teach it properly are those whom others have so named prophets of God. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. Amos 3 verse 7 These prophets were not received or appreciated by the religions of the world, and science would have nothing to do with their simple message of what the human race needs to do to find the peace and happiness it desires. Whether their message of truth was given in the Orient by the Buddha, the Middle East by Muhammad, to the ancient Greeks by Socrates, or to the arrogant Jews by a young man, it was the same. This Jewish man, who owned nothing, and was killed because he spoke against the religion to which he and his family belonged, taught the very same message, in order to realize peace and happiness, we must do unto others what we would want them to do unto us nothing more, nothing less. The prophet to whom the entire world will listen when the voice of his trumpet sounds is not like the religious and secular leaders of the world. This prophet does not want to be worshipped or set above another, but considers himself a servant to all. And, behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do, that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is, God, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Matthew 19 verses 16 to 17 And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, 
and of thy brethren that have the testimony which I gave unto you in the flesh as the man Jesus, worship God for that which he hath given you through me. For he who hath a testimony of that which I did as Jesus hath the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19 verse 10 And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true, and have been hidden from the foundation of the world because of the wickedness of men. But the Lord God, who called the holy prophets, and who sent his angels to shew unto his servants all things which must shortly come to pass, hath commanded his prophets to write these things and seal them up until the last days before I come again into the world. Behold, I am Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and I come quickly. Therefore, blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophets who have sealed up the prophecy of this book. And first John saw these things, and heard them. And when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of him who shewed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, but worship God who hath sent me, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. And this book doth not teach a man to fall down and worship another. But it teacheth a man to worship God, and keep his commandments in all things, and these are those things which have been sealed up to come forth unto the children of men. Revelation 22 verses 6 to 9 The mystery of God will no longer be a mystery. The mystery of God shall be revealed when the truth is finally brought to the world. And by this truth, we shall all be set free from the chains of hell with which the whole world is bound. Verse 8 And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go and take the little book which was sealed with the seven seals, and is now opened in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. John mentions a voice from heaven, see verse 4, commanding him to first, seal up the things which he knows, and then to take the little book from the hand of the angel, who is Christ. This refers to the way in which true prophets of God are called by those who are in charge of this solar system. The gods have not only created Christ to fulfill a specific mission for the earth, but also have called other prophets to do particular works designed specifically for their times. John continues to describe this heavenly calling. Verse 9 And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Verse 10 And I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and ate it up, and it was in my mouth. Sweet as honey, for that which I read brought much joy to my soul, but as soon as I had eaten, it, my belly was bitter. The prophet Ezekiel put it this way, And he said unto me, Son of man, I send thee to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that hath rebelled against me, they and their fathers have transgressed against me, even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff-hearted, I do send thee unto them, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God. And they, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there hath been a prophet among them. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee, and thou dost dwell among scorpions, be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. And thou shalt speak my words unto them, whether they will hear, or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But thou, son of man, hear what I say unto thee, be not thou rebellious like that rebellious house, open thy mouth, and eat that I give thee. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and, lo, a roll of a book was therein, and he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations, and mourning, and woe. Moreover he said unto me, Son of man, eat that thou findest, eat this roll, and go speak unto the house of Israel. 
So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat, and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. Ezekiel 2 verses 3 to 10, 3 colon 1, 3. Prophets are fed the knowledge and understanding of the eternal plan of God. Though it has always been the same, this plan is unknown to the mortal world because of the inability of the human brain to recollect the recorded experiences in the molecules that make up their spirits. This fleshly brain is the veil through which most mortals cannot see, remember, while in mortality. The reason for this veil is so that we will have the opportunity to experience the opposite of God's eternal plan of happiness. If we could consciously recall everything our spirits have recorded throughout the eons of millenniums we have existed, we would not be prone to experience the bad, because we would know better. Every prophet called of God to perform a specific work must be called in the exact same manner as those before him, as will those after him. Prophets are usually male and gender, giving life to the world through their words, while the more refined and righteous females give life to the world through the birth of a child. All prophets pass through tribulation and rebellion against God before they are called. There has been only one prophet who from his birth into mortality did not rebel against God Jesus Christ, he who could not sin because of the pre-programmed nature of his soul. In order to keep the other prophets humbled and focused on the work of the Father, instead of on their own fleshly agendas, they are purposely weakened in the flesh in many ways. The story goes that Moses couldn't speak well, and many others were small of stature and uncomely to look upon. This kept them always aware that no matter how much they were given to know, they were still nothing and equal to all other people. Before Jesus came to the people in his role as a prophet, he was preceded by John the Baptist. The Jews could accept John because he was plainly dressed in camel skins, ate locusts, ironic symbolism here, and lived in the desert. The Jews had a harder time accepting Jesus because he was seen as a beautiful man who dressed normally, had women following after him, and ate and drank with the sinners. Except for Jesus Christ, all other prophets have passed through years of refinement and preparation until each has arrived, through the use of his own free will, at an emotional state of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. This is further brought upon each by the recognition of the wicked state in which the people of his particular culture live. Each humbles himself before God and asks for a better understanding of truth. After a period of refinement, and if the supplicant has been chosen to perform a specific work, a celestial being will appear and take the veil away from his eyes through certain physical changes. The prophet Daniel explains it well. And whiles I was speaking, and praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yeah, Whiles I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me, and talked with me, and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications the commandment came forth, and I am come to shew thee, for thou art greatly beloved, Therefore understand the matter, and consider the vision. Daniel 9 verses 20 to 23 In order for this understanding to take place, or for the veil to be removed, a physical change must take place on a cellular level in the mortal brain of the prophet. An angel of God who has the knowledge, power, and technology to do so properly does this unveiling. John figuratively expresses this by showing that a voice from heaven did not actually teach him anything, but commanded him to do a physical act involving an angel, take the book and eat it. 
A person might lose substantial memory after being struck violently in the head, thereby changing the physical structure of their brain. Prophets, on the other hand, through actual physical contact with an exalted being, receive the ability to remember things written in the book. There is no other way to be called as a prophet of God. Upon having the veil removed so that the eyes of their understanding are more fully opened, prophets rejoice in the great and wondrous plan of the Father in fulfilling His covenant of happiness with His creations. This is what is meant by it was in my mouth sweet as honey. But as they go to preach the wonderful good news, the gospel, their knowledge becomes bitter because of the rejection due to the ignorance of the people. Though it would seem fair of a God who is no respecter of persons to allow celestial beings to reveal themselves to all those who humble themselves properly with a broken heart and contrite spirit, doing so would negate the purpose of the veil and our mortal existence. The veil allows us to live without a sure knowledge of God, so that we may become who and what we really are according to our individual desires of happiness, and not what we think God expects us to become. In other words, most people are good when the spotlight is on them and when they are told everything they should do, but the truer nature of individual souls will shine when they are left to themselves with nobody else around who might influence them to be someone they really are not. Furthermore, if everyone had a sure knowledge of an afterlife of peace, tranquility, and happiness, and we realized that suicide was a choice, not a sin, how many of us would really hang around in the hell we have created for ourselves here? This sure knowledge and instruction is only given to some, prophets, who are to perform specific missions. There are many other prophets and righteous men who become knowledgeable by listening to others who have been given the physical ability to know the mysteries of God. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Matthew 13 verses 16 to 17 Jesus commended those who believe without a physical manifestation. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet have believed. John 20 verse 29 Speaking to the elect, Peter said, That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, and whom, though now ye see him not, Yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what, or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow unto whom it was revealed, that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. 1 Peter 1 verses 7 to 12 John was chosen to prepare a revelation that would reveal to the people of the world what has happened on this earth, and what would take place in the latter days. He received this knowledge from the mouth of Christ and prepared it in such a way that the mystery would remain hidden until the right time. Today is that time. This book is that venue. Verse 11 And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. John was commanded to seal up the things which he heard. He did so in the figurative expressions, metaphors, and allegories he presents in the book of Revelation. He knew that no one, 
without the proper authority and physical changes required in the memory and thinking capabilities of the brain, would be able to unlock the mystery of his words unless that person was given the same book to eat, the same mission to perform, that was given to him. Furthermore, John's message was set to come forth in plainness in the latter days by his own mouth. In other words, John himself would guide the unveiling of his written revelation. He would do this by directing the one who would be given the authority to do so under his supervision. This book fulfills the commandment given to John that he must prophesy again to the entire world. This concludes chapter 10.